I want to continue on the subject of the kingdom and we're going to talk about rediscovering the kingdom mandate. Our focus today will be identifying your role in the program of God's corporate will. And this is an incredible, an, the most important subject that anyone can ever study. And that is the kingdom mandate of God. I want to begin by dealing first of all with God's original purpose. The reason why everything should begin with purpose is because purpose is the motivation for all of God's actions. Proverbs 19.21, my favorite verse says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that will prevail. Proverbs 19, verse 21. Written by King Solomon, inspired by the Holy Spirit, this one statement summarizes the entire reasoning for life. I will read it again. It says in Proverbs 19, 21, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. That statement means that purpose is more important than plans, purpose is more powerful than plans, and purpose precedes plans. It also implies, without question, that the only thing that motivates God is His purpose, not your plans. Let me read it again. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord's purpose will prevail over all a man's plans. The King James Version says, Many are the devices in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's counsel that will prevail or will stand. The word purpose, therefore, and counsel means the same thing. Why is the word counsel used in the old King James, 16th century version? And why is the word purpose our most tr modern translation from the Hebrew? Because the word counsel produces purpose. A counsel means to actually have a meeting with yourself. God counseled himself about what he wanted to do and then he concluded the meeting and decided what he wanted and it became his purpose. The word purpose means original intent. Write it down please. The words purpose mean original intent. In other words, there's something that God originally intended to have and that is what he calls his purpose. The word purpose in the Hebrew is also the word that we translate will. W-I-L-L, -L, will. Whenever you see the term will of God, you can literally say the purpose of God. They're the same thing. So God's will is God's purpose. Therefore, God's purpose is what God originally intended. Therefore, the entire book that you call the Bible, a library of 66 books, contains in it God's will. What is God's will? God's purpose. What is God's purpose? God's original intent. The word purpose, therefore, is also defined in the biblical text as reason for creation. It means the reason why God created everything. Why did God do something is what is called purpose. So purpose is the reason why things exist. Purpose, therefore, is the original intention that God had in mind when he created everything and anything. Purpose, therefore, is simply why. Why did God create planet Earth? Why did God create mankind? Why did God create nature? Why did God create the universe? Why did God give you uh, what he has promised you? Wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Why did God give us the, the, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the reptile kingdom, and the kingdoms of this natural world? Why did God do all of this? The reason is he has an original intent. Now, the only thing that God wants is what he originally intended. That is a critical point. The only thing that God wants is what he originally intended. In other words, God is only interested in what he originally wanted. Everything else is not interesting to God. What does God want then is his will. Matter of fact, the only thing that motivates God is not your will but his will that's why that statement is so important in the book of Proverbs it says many are the plans in your heart the word heart there has nothing to do with your chest 
The Hebrew word there actually means mind. God says, many are the plans in your mind. You have your own ideas, he says, about your life and about life. What you want to do, what you want to be, where you want to go, how you want to live, who you want to marry, what career you want, what vocation you want, what, you want to, what kind of ministry you want. God said you got all these ideas about your life. He said, but my purpose for your life will prevail over everything you're planning. In other words, God is saying before you make plans for your life, consult me for your purpose. It's tragic to spend 30, 40 years working on a plan God never gave you, never gave you birth to do. It's possible to be successful failures. Because, because you can be successful in something God never gave you birth to do. Therefore, it's more important to discover purpose than to make plans. And you should make your plans according to God's purpose for your life so that your plans will be in sync with your reason for being. God says, my purpose is supreme to me. My purpose will prevail over everything man thinks, conceives, develops, or devises. God says, I will accomplish what I purpose, which means I will accomplish what I originally intended to have. Can I hear an amen? amen. When Jesus came, his first public statement, we read about it yesterday, was God's original will. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. In other words, he came back with an old idea. He said, I came back to restore what God originally intended, which was my kingdom on earth. God never changes his purpose. Write this down. Plans may change, but purpose is permanent. God's plans were interrupted in Genesis chapter 3, but his purposes were never changed. This is why when Jesus came in Matthew chapter 5 and introduced his first sermon, the last part of the sermon, he made a statement very clearly stated. He said, I didn't come to change the law, nor would the prophets prophesy. Now, why did he make that clear up front? He's saying, look, I didn't come to introduce a new idea. I didn't come to create something new that God never talked about. In other words, whatever the prophets talked about is what God told them about, and I am God in the flesh. Therefore, I came to do what I told them. I didn't come to change the laws. Why? The laws are the principles and the precepts by which my kingdom works. And whatever laws I gave Moses, those laws are valid today. I didn't come to change the law nor to destroy the prophecies. But I came to what? Fulfill them. I came to bring them into effect. And then he makes a statement we don't understand sometimes. He says, and therefore, Heaven and earth will pass away before one statement God made falls unfulfilled. In other words, no matter what happens, even if God got to move the present heaven and the present earth and create a new heaven and a new earth, he will do it to keep his original word. It's a little heavy. In other words, what God intended, he will have even if he got to create new products. He doesn't change his assignment. So what is God's original purpose? Matthew 24, verse 14. I want you to turn there, please. Very important verse of scripture. Uh, those of you who studied theology and hermeneutics will know that it's very important for you when you're reading an historical document to understand what they call context. You should never read one verse of scripture it is very dangerous to speak and teach from one verse of scripture. Now, people do it all the time, but it's very dangerous because context is more important than text. I've seen preachers mutilate scripture by taking one verse and making it say what they want it to say. It's very dangerous to do that. It creates error. 
Every verse must be kept in context so that the meaning of the verse would be true to its original author. When you read Matthew 24, you've got to read this in context. Now when you look at Matthew 24, turn there please, you look at the first three verses, you'll find that there was a question asked by the disciples, the apostles, the disciples of Jesus. They asked him a question concerning the end times. Their question was, when will the end come? You see that question there? They were asking about the end of the world or the end of the age. And they said, when will the end come? Tell us what will be the signs that the end is upon us. And in verse 3, they said, when will this happen? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, I think all of us here have been asking those questions. And since September 11th, most of us think it has arrived. I have come to announce to you that September 11th has nothing to do with the end of the world. Nothing to do with it. God saw Pharaoh kill thousands of babies. He saw Herod kill thousands of babies. He saw all kinds of terrorism all the time. It never touches God. When God is ready, God moves. Clap right there loud. <laughs> when September 11 took place, somehow the pulpits of our countries became the source of messages of doom. These are the last days. The Lord is coming soon. Prepare yourself. You better get ready. You better keep your soul in order. My God, there's danger in the air. Terror, the devil is coming. All this stuff. Lies, not true. Always read your Bible, not the hymn books. Always study the word, not just your preacher's sermons. God has not left anything in the dark. So when you read chapter 24, the question was, what would be the sign of the end time and when will you come, Jesus, the second time? Please notice, he did not say to them, well, I cannot tell you. It's a mystery. It's a secret, you know. Uh, and you're not supposed to ask these deep questions. He didn't do that. He told them exactly when the end will come. Now, you've been taught, like I've been taught when I was in church, that no one knows the end. No one knows when the end will come. That's not true. I know when the end will come. And I've already seen it. And Christ told us when the end will come. <laughs> Did you see your face? Oh, really? <laughs> Let's read what he says. The question was, when will the end come? And when will the second coming of the Son of Man be? He begins to answer them. Matter of fact, look at verse 4, the first two words. What's the first two words? I can't hear you. Jesus answered. Isn't that beautiful? They said, when will the end come? And when will be the sign of your second coming? It says, and Jesus answered them. So we're going to tell him now when the end will come. Number one, he says, watch out that no one deceives you. In other words, people walking around saying, he's coming now, he's coming there, he's going to be here, he's going to be there. Verse 5, for many will come in my name claiming, I am the Christ. And they will deceive many. Underline that statement, please. I am the Christ. He's talking about people who come in every generation claiming that they are the anointed of God. Now, since Christ left the earth, there have been many who came and said that they came to complete God's work. So you got Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, you got Islam, you got, you know, Baha'i faith, you got all these Scientologists, you got all these gurus. He says, look, there are going to be many coming saying, I got the final word. He said, but don't be deceived. In other words, don't be surprised when there are many different religions. 
Christ is prophesying here about the rise of religious leaders who will create religions. He says, you will see much of that, but look at the next statement. He says, but the end is not yet. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not what? Alarmed or amazed. Why? Such things must happen, but, 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 but what? The end is not yet. My goodness, they're fighting in the Middle East, they're fighting in South America, they're fighting in South Africa, they're fighting in the Caribbean, they're fighting, ooh, Jesus coming. He says, look, don't let that make you believe that I'm coming. Yes, there will be many Christs and many conflicts and there'll be wars and rumors of wars and biological warfare and terrorist wars. He said, but the end is not yet. Read on, context. Then he says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, that's farmings, yes. That means both economic crisis and literal farming. And earthquakes in diverse places, are they happening now? Yes. All these are just what? The beginning of birth pains. Nothing to do with the end. Now I'm about to show you something going to blow your mind. He said, do not believe that these natural and human disasters have anything to do with the end. Verse 9, you'll be handed over to be persecuted, to be put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray each other, and many, will, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of many shall grow cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, he says all this will happen, but the end is not yet. Verse 14, he tells us when the end will come. This is surprising. I know when the end will come. The end will come in verse 14. Let's read it. He says, and when this gospel, not just any gospel, but when this gospel not just any gospel <laughs> but when this gospel not just any message but when this gospel of what I can't hear you say it loud louder what kind of gospel he said but when this gospel of the kingdom is preached into every part of the world to every nation as a testimony unto them. When that is done, read the next line, then the end will come. See, we know when the end will come. Clap. According to Jesus, the end will come when we, his disciples, preach a certain message. Wow, that's why he hasn't come yet. We're preaching all kind of stuff except what he told us to preach. We're preaching faith, preaching prosperity, preaching deliverance, preaching healing, preaching baptism in the Holy Spirit, preaching, you know, uh, 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 claiming, we're preaching all this stuff. He says, look, you're still not getting the right message. When this gospel of the kingdom is preached into all the world as a testimony. In other words, it will be demonstrated also. When every nation, and that word nation there is important, to every nation, write the word nation now. And the word nation is the Greek word ethnos. E-T-H-N-O-S. And this word ethnos used by Jesus, it, we usually refer to it as being ethnic groups. But it's not limited to ethnic groups. The word ethnos in the Greek means special groupings. An ethnos is a grouping of people that have a common language, a common uh, ethnic or ethnos belief system, a common uh, commitment to ideals. This is a strange word. Ethnos, therefore, when you use the word nation, 
ethnos, it means people who are committed to a single common ideal or a common commitment. For example, Great Britain is called a nation. But we don't all speak, nor are we from the same culture, are we? Different languages, different colors, different backgrounds, but yet we call ourselves a nation. Why is this a nation with so many colors and so many cultures and so many languages? Why is it still a nation? Because they are committed to the same ideal of parliamentary democracy, of freedom of speech. In other words, it's the ideals of commitment that make us an ethnos. Another way to put this is an ethnos is any group that has a common language and a common ideal commitment. It could be, for example, uh, medicine is an ethnos. If you go into the field of medicine, you got to learn a different language. You got to adhere to a different code of ethics and codes of, of conduct. When you enter the world of law, lawyers have a different ethnos. They got a different language, different ideals, different codes. You got to learn. That's why you got to study for many years to become a doctor or a lawyer. You got to learn the language. It's an ethnos. When you go into business, you got to learn the language of business. That's why you got to study business to understand its language, its ideals, its values, its ethnos. In the world of sports, you got to spend years developing your sports and athletic ability and learn the, the language of sports. Entertainment, you got to spend years learning about the field of entertainment and music and development and language of that field. Each one of these is an ethnos. The youth have their own language and their own ideals. That's an ethnos. Wherever there's a common grouping, that's an ethnos. The word there is nation. Christ says, I will not come until the message of the kingdom enters every ethnos. Every single nation must hear the good news of what? I can't hear you. Now here's what's important about this statement. Jesus said, the end will come when the church preaches this message to the whole world. Wow. Wow. The end depends on what you and I preach. It doesn't depend on the Antichrist. It doesn't depend on wars, rumors of wars. It doesn't depend on pestilence and farming and, and earthquakes. He said the end is not yet. He said the end will be controlled by my people. Now you're quiet for a reason. All right. I don't want you to miss this. Jesus said, look, the end of the world and the coming of the Messiah again is controlled by the church. He still missed it. He said, Look, when you preach this message, what, what message? The kingdom of God. When you preach that, he says, When I've convinced that all the world have heard that message and have an opportunity to receive it, then I will come. Which means that the end depends on you. I know this is tough, you know, this is tough because I had to change myself. Let me give you a, a cross reference for this. Jesus was asked the question about the end time three times by the disciples. The second time they asked him, they said, when will the end come? He answered them in a strange way. He said, the end of the age will be like, what, look at me, the days of Noah. You remember that? And they said, explain it to us. He says, well, in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking and rise up in that revelry. And the Lord spoke to Noah and told him to build an ark and for 120 years, Noah built the ark. And Jesus says, and when the ark was finished and the doors were shut by Noah, the rain began. Then he says, so will it be at the end of the age. Now, most of you still don't understand what he meant. So let's back up. He said, the end of the world would be just like it was in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, God had a problem with the planet 
and he wanted to consummate some things. So he went to Noah and he said, No, I need your cooperation. I need you to work with me. I want you to go and tell the whole known world that I'm going to destroy the earth with water. But if they believe what you say and they come into this boat I want you to build, they'll be safe. So your message is to go and tell them and warn them that danger is coming if they believe you and they obey you and come into this big boat called the ark then they will be safe and I'll destroy the world with water. What did Noah do? Noah obeyed God. So Noah began to build the boat. And Noah built the boat and while he was building it he went out and told the people. They said, what are you doing? He says, here's why I'm doing it. And he told them about the message God told him about the rain coming and the floods coming. <laughs> This is heavy. Now, <laughs> the rain was in God's control. But when it came, was in Noah's control. You'll get it later. God says, Noah, when you finish the ark and shut the door, the rain will start. The rain was ready. From the first day, God told it. <laughs> Some of you are getting it. But the rain had to wait until Noah was finished. Now if Noah had finished the ark in 50 years and shut the door, the rain would have come. If Noah had shut the ark at 100 years, the rain would have come. In other words, the rain was waiting on Noah's assignment. So Jesus said, the end will come because the end is waiting on your assignment. He said, the Son of God will come, but he's waiting on the church to complete its assignment. As soon as Noah closed the door, it says, immediately the rain began. What are we preaching? That determines if Jesus comes. And when this gospel, everybody say this. Now if I say this is my watch, that means there are other watches around. Some of you getting it. If I said this is the watch, that means there's no other around. But if I say, this watch, that means there are other watches. Christ says, when this gospel, in other words, there are many other preaching going around, a lot of stuff people preaching. He said, but when we get to this one, when we preach this stuff, the kingdom of God, and you preach it all over the world, then the end will come. In the book of Acts chapter 1, <laughs> The disciples asked him after the resurrection, will you now establish the kingdom? He says, look, the hour, when that's supposed to be established, no one knows the hour. The Father knows the hour, but the time we know. <laughs> what time? The time when we preach the gospel of the kingdom. Now, I have a very strange suggestion. I suggest that the church itself has not even understood the kingdom. How can we preach it? We are experts in religion, but not the kingdom. This is going to get a little heavy. Matthew 4, 17. The first statement of Jesus we read yesterday. When he began his ministry at age 30. It says, and Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. What is this big deal about the kingdom? Well, let's talk about the assignment of Jesus. Number one, the original plan of God was to extend his heavenly kingdom on earth through mankind. This is God's original plan. 
to extend his heavenly kingdom on earth through mankind. Number two, his purpose was to establish a family of sons and not servants. And that's important because religion teaches us to be servants of the Lord. But the kingdom teaches us to be sons of God. A servant and a son are different. Hmm. I remember growing up in a religious environment and all I heard people say was, well, I want to thank God. I'm just a servant of the Lord. I'm a servant of the Lord. And it sounds so good, you know, I'm a servant of the Lord. It sounds so good. But Jesus never said you must call yourself that. Religion makes you almost subjugated. <laughs> God never wanted servants. He wanted what? Sons. Christ says in John chapter 1, as many as believed on him, to them gave he the authority to call themselves what? Sons of God. He told a story about the prodigal son and he said, look, there was a man who had two sons. One went away and squandered all of his goods and then he said in the pig pen, he said, I will go back to my father, that's religion, and I will ask him to be just a servant. It's religion. I'm not good enough to be sitting with Christ, so I sit at his doormat. I just want to be a servant of the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. It sounds so good, so, so humble, doesn't it? Serve the Lord. Let me ask you a question. If you got a son or daughter in your house, and they said, look, I don't want to be your daughter or your son. I want to be the maid. Come on, let's be honest. How do you feel about that? No, no, mom, I don't want to eat at the table. I'll eat outside by the step. I, I'm not good enough to be sitting at the table, daddy. I want to eat outside under the tree. Right. I don't want to be a son. Just make me a servant. Listen to him. I am not worthy, he said. Sounds like a Christian, doesn't it? I'm not worthy to be saved by grace. Oh, yes, you are. He saved before you even knew it. This false humility that we call humility makes God sick. God wants you to walk boldly into the throne room and say, Hello, Pops. How are you doing today? You promised to do this for me and do that for me and do this for me. Come on, do it to me. That's what he wants. And Christ says when the son came back home, when the father saw him a long way off, he ran toward him. And before the son could even say, I want to be a servant, he mashed his face up in his chest. <laughs> didn't want to hear a word he had to say you know half of the things you're telling God about God doesn't even want to hear you know where I've been Lord what I, he said shut up do you know who I slept with what I drank shut up my son who was once lost he's found and to prove it, bring the ring, which is a sign of his identity with the family. Bring the robe, which is the status of his equality with the children and the father. And bring the slipper, which puts him back in right standing with the family. And kill the best reserved cow for special quality royalty. Tell your neighbor the royalty just come back home. Give him a hand. He's a faithful God. He, 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 he wants sons. Jesus said that a son has inheritance with the father. Number three, he wanted to establish a kingdom of sons, not subjects. I'm glad we are in England today talking about this. Because England was built on a monarchy. Matter of fact, England has a history of being a kingdom. <laughs> Hmm. 
England still has remnants of kingdom concepts, just remnants of it left. And I'm kind of glad, because now we can understand it a little bit. The book in your hand is not a democracy. The book in your hand is not about a parliamentary democracy. It is not about a republic. The book in your hand is about a kingdom. God is not a prime minister. Jesus Christ is not a prime minister. He's not a president. He's a king. This is important. Therefore, the book that you have in your hand called the Bible is not about a republic. It's not about a democracy. As a matter of fact, the Bible is not democratic at all. The difference between a king and a prime minister or a president is that you vote a prime minister into power and you vote a president, but you don't vote for a king. Oh, I want to talk to you today. In a republic and in a democracy, everybody got a vote. In a kingdom, there is no vote. In a democracy, you can have a referendum and change the constitution. In a kingdom, there is no referendum. Your opinion doesn't count in a kingdom. I'm going to shout all by myself. In a kingdom, you have no individual rights. But in a democracy, you got individual rights. In a kingdom, the word of the king is law. In a democracy, the people make the laws. In a democracy, you can change the leader if you don't like him. But in a kingdom, you're the one that changes, not the king. I'm going to shout hallelujah by myself. In a democracy, you could introduce your own ideas and make it legislation and law. But in a kingdom, the ideas of the king becomes law. I don't want to preach yet. Now, I'm going to bless you. Watch this. In a kingdom, an earthly kingdom, there's a king and there, there are subjects. Now, those of you who are from the former Commonwealth nations like I am, come on, Africa, talk to me. All of us in the Caribbean and the African countries, we were all dominated by the imperialistic power of Great Britain. Great Britain was the United Kingdom of Great Britain. It was a kingdom ruled by a king and a queen, and we were subjects. Everybody say subjects. Say it again, subjects. Now the word subject is a prefix. Sub means below. Now you all listen carefully. In the kingdom of the world, the people in the kingdom are subjects. And sometimes they are rejects. Now, if you are a subject, the very word destroys your self concept. I'm trying to get at a point, very important point. The kingdoms of the world make their citizens subjects. But the kingdom of God, oh, hallelujah. Is the only kingdom. Woo! Is the only kingdom where the king and all the subjects are family. <laughs> it's the only kingdom where the king and the subjects are all kings, and he is called the king of shout somebody. Come on, praise his name. You don't understand the message. In the, in the United Kingdom, we got the House of Lords, and then you got the subjects. But in the kingdom of God, we got a Lord. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's the Lord of... Shout everybody, praise his name. Stand up on your feet and your back. Say glory! That's why it's called 
Good news. The kingdom is called what? Good news. Why? It doesn't oppress and depress and suppress people. It sets them free to sit with Christ in heavenly place. Oh, hey! Oh, I'm about to sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and worship him for a second. Worship the king. Come on, kings. Worship the king, kings. Tell him how you feel about him. I love you, King Jesus. He's the king of the kings. Oh, hallelujah. I say hallelujah. <laughs> he came to establish a kingdom of sons not a kingdom of subjects next he came to establish a commonwealth of citizens not Christians now we got some problems here the original plan of God was never to have Christians <laughs> a Christian, write this down, is a religious creature. A citizen is a legal creature. Help me, Holy Spirit. I'm going to say it again. A Christian is a religious creature. I used to be a Christian. It almost killed me. I was poor and enjoying poverty because religion makes you comfortable in poverty. I was sick and enjoying sickness. Why? Because religion makes you comfortable in sickness. The word Christian was never, ever used by Jesus. It was never introduced by Jesus and he never ever told us to call ourselves that. Never. The word Christian was created by and introduced by pagans. Read your history. Peter never used it. James never used it. John never used it. Paul mentions it twice when he was in a pagan town. When the pagans didn't know what to call the believers. So they invented this word that you've adopted. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I don't want to carry any name the pagans gave me. I want the name he gave me. He says, you are sons of God. Come on, shout amen, somebody. He says, you are kings and priests. Oh, I like that better. A Christian is a religious person. A citizen is a legal person. Christians belong to a religious group but a citizen belongs to a kingdom a religious creature gets things from his gods by appeasing them a citizen gets things from his government by qualifying for them a citizen is different a religious person gets things from their gods by doing acts of worship. But a citizen gets things from his government by demanding his rights. <laughs> oh, we got to get it, man. So when you are a Christian, that's why you got to do a lot of things to make God like you. Sorry. 
because you are just like the heathen and the pagans pagans build temples to their gods they bring food to their gods they offer money to their gods they do oblations they pour out all kind of wine and blood they offer sacrifices I mean the Romans did it the Greeks did it the Herodians did it the Assyrians did it the Babylonians did it. these were not atheists they believed in gods they were religious people the Romans were very religious matter of fact the word used for these different religions was simply pagans a pagan is not an atheist a pagan is a worshiper a religious person that served their gods and was very dedicated to their gods the Romans had many temples that they worship in God of Zeus God of Paulus Diana of the Ephesians all of these major gods they were worshiping people and they threw the believers of Christ into another category they call them, you just another religion called Christians and that's why Christians today are listed among one of the world religions what a tragedy I said what a tragedy Chris oh we got religions in our country we got Islam Buddhism Christianity, Sautism, Taoism, Scientology. See, they list you as one of them, but not me. No, I got delivered from that stuff. Can I hear an amen? When Jesus walked the earth, they didn't know what to call him. He wasn't a Pharisee, because they were far, you see. He wasn't a Sadducee, because they were sad, you see. <laughs> he wasn't an Herodian. He was not an Essene like John. He was this guy that couldn't categorize. Many times when they met him, their first question was, who are you? <laughs> if you get the message today that I'm teaching of the kingdom, when you go back to work, they'll say, who are you? On your answer should not be I am a Christian why that's a religious person tell him oh I am a son of the living God working here in this location to bring transformation to this job come on shout hallelujah man oh hallelujah everybody said the kingdom is coming alive inside of me When I was a Christian, <laughs> I owed everybody. This is the truth of my testimony. When I understood the kingdom, today I am debt free. <laughs> I can't tell you all my testimony. No, you won't believe it. Anyhow. <laughs> no you couldn't take it he came to establish <laughs> he came to establish a what a commonwealth of citizens not Christian let me just come to this word commonwealth see those of us who were born under colonialism like most of you you know they they call us the commonwealth of nations and what they meant by that was Great Britain colonized all of us and the wealth of Great Britain was supposed to belong to the common wealth of nations in the Commonwealth now let's discuss this a minute <laughs> now, now, now th that was the intention the intention was all the nations in the Commonwealth of Great Britain were supposed to be equally sharing the wealth. That's why it's called common wealth. But somehow the wealth in that kingdom was not common. Can I talk to you a little bit? As a matter of fact, in many cases, 
the kingdom took the wealth from the colonies and brought it back to the kingdom. Oh, but the kingdom of God is a different kingdom. The Bible says, my kingdom shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in the headquarters. Shout somebody. It's the only kingdom that takes the wealth from the headquarters and sends it to the colony. Oh, I'm so glad to be in the kingdom. Our kingdom is so unique that instead of the subjects dying to protect the king the king died to protect <laughs> it's the only kingdom for you to go and see queen elizabeth you gotta drive up to the gate they gotta check you out first you gotta have appointment three years in advance you got to go through this gate, that gate, another gate, another gate, another gate, another security. But in this kingdom, the king left his throne, came outside, opened the gate and said, Whosoever will, shout somebody. Kingdom of God. Let me tell you something, sister. In the kingdoms of the world, you cannot go into Buckingham Palace today and sit on that woman's chair. But in the kingdom of God, he said, come and sit with me in heavenly. Shout hallelujah, somebody. Clap your hands and Shabbat. Hallelujah, man. Woo, I'm so glad I'm in the kingdom. Tell your neighbor, I got royal blood. I got royal blood. I got royal blood. Come on, tell somebody. Tell them, shake your hand. Say, I got royal blood. I got royal blood. I got the genes of a king. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout to the Lord with the voice of triumph. Oh, hallelujah. I am a son, not a servant. Sit down quick. I got time to get praise God hey boy said the wealth is common see y'all look at pastor Matthew and sister Asha Maloa and you say Woo, nice shoes nice dress fine car nice house and God is saying what's your problem everything they got you could have and more in this kingdom it's for everybody according to your faith be it unto you there's no jealousy in this kingdom because the wealth belongs to all the citizens say amen somebody lift your hands and say lord give me mine now go ahead thank him for it he's a faithful god he's a faithful king Number five, write this down. God's original plan was he desired relationship, not religion. Write it down. He desired what? Relationship and not religion. Religion is man's search for God. Relationship is God's search for man. Religion is man trying to reach God. The kingdom is God coming down to reach man. You can identify a Muslim. You can identify a Hindu. 
You can identify a Christian. How come they couldn't identify Jesus even to arrest him? My, 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 my. You see, <laughs> when we show up in the job or in the factory or in the classroom or in government or in athletics or in entertainment, wherever we show up, they're not supposed to know who we are until it's too late. Some of you are getting it. See, citizenship is more important than membership. You cannot fight people you can't identify. <laughs> that is why Jesus never said, ever, ever said, build buildings with steeples and bells. Never. He never said, wear symbols that identify you as one of mine. Never. Have a pulpit and chairs and a podium and an organ. Never. He said, go into all the different worlds. The world of business, the world of sports, the world of politics, the world of youth, the world of entertainment. Go into all the worlds. And, he said, and then infect them with the kingdom. So I, I sit with Muslims, talk with them about the Quran. They still don't know who I am. For hours we talk. We talk about economics, we talk about policies of government, we talk about globalization, we talk about tech, technology and advancement, we talk about cyberspace, we talk, we talk, we talk. And then it says, you are different. Where are you from? I said, I'm from another country. Which country? I said, it's, it's, it's out of this world, you won't believe it. 